Welcome to the Sugar Beet Grower Seminar for producers from the Canadian border all the way to Grand Forks, Crookston, Drayton factory districts. And if you're from some other factory districts, welcome as well. Uh, thank you very much to our growers uh, through your checkoff for funding our resource program and our educational program. Thank you to the administration at American Crystal for sharing the word to you and for getting you all to uh, be here this morning at the meeting. So the program this morning, after we're done with the survey, we'll have Dr. Ashok Chanda. He will speak about rhizoctonia management. That will be followed by me discussing leaf spot and a little touch on white mold. We'll then have a 15 minutes break, followed by Dr. Peters, who will discuss weed control, and Dr. Botel, who will discuss insect control. We will then share with you some evaluation forms for your feedback, and then we'll have about 30 minutes or so for general questions that you may have. Thank you all for being here. Our first speaker this morning will be Dr. Ashok Chanda. He will be speaking about management of rhizoctonia. Good morning, everybody. I see on my video, I see some kind of uh, this uh, halo on my head. So I'm just going to turn off my video, but I'll be available here until noon. So if you have questions now or later, I'll be happy to visit with any one of you. Uh, I would rather be in person to talk to you, uh, but unfortunately, you know, these are uh, different times. Uh, but, you know, as you guys embrace and love technology, we all love, at least the technology is able to connect us with each other. So I'm extension sugar beet pathologist with the University of Minnesota. So probably most of you know, here's my contact information um, and the email address. So today, primarily, I'm going to talk about management of rhizoctonia, but it's a little bit interesting, you know, doing the surveys just prior to this talk so we can gain some insight uh, about some of the other problems. But one thing I always emphasize is uh, we just need to know what's killing beets in our fields, right? Sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes it's, it's difficult, even for us, you know, we, it's a hard time uh, to isolate these in cultures. But the trend has been more or less similar for the past few years. So the most number of samples we saw were for rhizoctonia again in 2020, followed by phenomyces uh, and some mixed infections are very common here. So this morning, at least 75% of you said rhizoctonia was a problem and 25% you know, phenomyces, uh, I completely agree. And again, it depends from field to field. So when we think about aphanomyces, still you need to rely on a seed treatment, whether it is touch 20 or touch 45. And especially if the planting gets delayed because of unfavorable weather, that's when you know, it's tricky for aphanomyces seedling damping off. But at least some of you were using lime five to 10 tons per acre, you know, which is very good for managing aphanomyces. You know, that's the only remedy we have to manage the disease later in the season. And uh, physarium, it's uh, a little bit down in 2020. I think it's great to see that because the only control we have for physarium right now are tolerant varieties. We don't have any seed treatment or any fungicide to apply in for or post. So we've been looking into that. Uh, probably you know, there is some hope in the future. And then we saw very few samples for pythium especially, you know, some of the fields have some excess moisture, so it's not uncommon to see pythium, but it's not at a level that it will reduce the yield. And uh, some samples, we did not recover anything, uh, particularly, you know, if it's caused by uh, heat stress or uh, wind injury, you know, we, we put them in this basket for other, right? So there are a few, few samples. I think most of you had good emergence, but I did see some fields uh, having some em emergence issues. I think when you had insufficient moisture during planting, I think that, that relate, resulted in that. So again, you know, just to make my point here, right, this is the field close to Crookston, you know, a few years ago, the grower thought it was rhizoctonia, and then he went ahead next time when he had beets, uh, but he was curious to plant two different varieties here. And it's pretty obvious, you know, only one variety is doing pretty good, but not the other. So it happened to be physarium. It was not rhizoctonia that was uh, killing beets in that particular field. You know, obviously this is the better performing variety, right? You know, it has better physarium tolerance, but you know, if, if you go with rhizoctonia ratings, uh, it could be a big risk uh, going in there. 
And the other possibility, right? So we have probably one major issue in, in a field, uh, but unfortunately there are more than one issues uh, in a given year. This particular field, uh, we were only expecting to see rhizoctonia here, but it had both rhizoctonia and epanomyces. And look at this, uh, the center four rows, right? So this is still July 21st. So most of these plants were lost uh, in a few weeks after that. But again, there is no seed treatment for rhizoctonia or epanomyces in this particular trial, right? So that's why uh, we have this good insurance with the seed treatments. When we think about rhizoctonia, uh, it's a full season pathogen, right? So the time we put the seed in the ground until we harvest, you know, the risk is there uh, all this time. It just depends, you know, when it, when it really shows up and hits your beets. So what we can see typically is maybe uh, uneven stands early on. Uh, that's because, you know, you lost some of those during emergence. But once they emerge, uh, you could get a post-emergence damping off. And what you see is the necrosis just at or below the soil line, sometimes just down below uh, on the roads here. But you're going to lose this uh, ceiling. The other thing that happens just with if you have any emergence issues, right? So some will emerge later and later as they get more moisture. But you know, generally, the young plants are uh, more susceptible to rhizoctonia compared to the older ones. So, you know, you, you could lose these later as we go later into the season. But really, you know, when we hit this, you know, July and August, uh, how, how do we know that we are dealing with rhizoctonia, right? There is no easy way. Everything is below ground. But oftentimes, you know, if you just go in the afternoon and then try to scout when it's a little bit drier, I think I would, I would pick a day when it's dry. You see this wilting of the older leaves. Uh, see how droopy these are, almost touching the ground here. But once you have a significant row trot, you know, the wilting is irreversible. So you're not going to see these uh, leaves coming back up. But if it's just at the beginning phase, in the morning, they may look okay, but the afternoon is the best time. And oftentimes, if you have a severe infection, uh, there are a couple of, you know, dead plants right next to that. That's an indication of rhizoctonia. It's pretty much, you know, moving from here to there, you know, within the row. And if you have really severe rhizoctonia, what you see are these patches. And then again, a lot of yellow leaves. Uh, we call this chlorosis because it lost uh, chlorophyll. And then in a collapse of these crowns, by the end of the season, what we will see is typically, you know, spiders, you know, these dried petioles uh, with most of the foliage dead, you know, they're just lying flat on the ground, just like a spider. But the real damage is actually on the root, right? So we are seeing uh, probably less and less crown rot, but on the roots, uh, the classic symptom for rhizoctonia, these are very dark necrotic lesions. So necrosis is almost like a cell death. Uh, sometimes the lesions will make a ladder-like pattern, so it's very obvious for rhizoctonia. But since uh, we have Roundup Ready beets for several years now, uh, another pattern that we are seeing, or you know, most of the crown area looks very clean, and sometimes even the tip of the roots look clean, and you have rhizoctonia uh, just somewhere in the middle. And also, there is a possibility that you know it could extend all the way from the tip almost towards just below the crown, right? So this is not uncommon to see this now, but you know we are doing less and less cultivation. But again, with the emergence of resistant weeds, I think we're doing one or two cultivations. So one thing to keep in mind is uh, you know, that will also increase the risk for uh, rhizoctonia in those fields. So what happens when these beets die? So when these beets die, rhizoctonia will take a different form. Uh, we call this as a sclerotia. You know, it's very dormant. It can lay in the soil for two to three years or even uh, organic matter. You know, it could just survive as a saprophyte. But the more we have at the end of the season means there is more risk for the uh, no, next crops in the rotation or, you know, the next sugar beet crop. Uh, we used to use a zero to seven scale for rating rhizoctonia, but in 2020, we decided to use this new scale. It's a zero to 10. So some of the data that I'm going to show later in my presentation is based on this. So if, if I tell you we had a root rot about four at the end of the season, so more or less the beets look like this based on the different treatments, you know, if it is two or three, right? So then damage from rhizoctonia is twofold. Number one, if we have more and more root rot, you're going to lose stands and also you lose yield and quality. But number two, 
anytime we put beats uh, above a rating of five in the storage piles, they don't really store well. There's more and more uh, losses from respiration and then a lot of storage losses. So it's going to affect you uh, in terms of uh, second and third payment, so which is not really good. So some key points, right? So when we think about rhizoctonia, primarily I'm ta talking about AG2-2, you know, that's the group that uh, we are uh, more concerned about in sugar beets or in soybeans or dry beans in our growing area. You know, AG4 typically used to be, you know, early season, the seedling dapping off pathogen, but I think we are seeing more and more AG2-2 in our area. And it has a very wide host range, right? Sugar beet is an excellent host. Soybean, edible beans, corn, even sunflower, you know, it's an excellent uh, host for rhizoctonia. And some of the weeds uh, that are common in the sugar beets and other rotation crops also serve as a host. Right, so in any given year, you have this bridge of rhizoctonia from one year to another year. So if you do a better job at managing weeds, you can also manage rhizoctonia that way. Like I said, sclerotia could survive in the soil for two to three years. Uh, so it, it's a key. And when we look at the distribution of rhizoctonia, it's very patchy because you, you have like a very severe rhizoc at one side in a field and then right next to it, it could be very healthy. So, but if you think if you have Aphanomyces, the pattern is a little different because it makes these pores that can uh, swim and then distribute in a soil. So you get extensive patches. I would say it's almost more or less uniform in the field. It's a much bigger patch compared to Rhizoctonia. And then uh, where Rhizoctonia is located in a particular field, you know, I'm talking in terms of soil depth, it could really vary depending on your tillage practices or anything that you're doing, right? Sometimes it's just in the top two to four inches or top four inches. And in some severe fields, actually we could see rhizoctonia all the way up to six inches, right? So that, that's the key there. Again, I talked about cultivation. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, anytime you throw soil, because basically you're also getting rhizoc into the crowns, you know, the pedioles, the base of the pedioles are a little bit more sensitive for this uh, particular pathogen. And anything that we can do to reduce uh, the inoculum buildup, whether in sugar beets or in the rotation crops is you know, very good for managing this disease. So when I talk about crop rotation, I'd say, you know, typically you're doing three to four year rotation, which is very good for sugar beets. And most of you said you're growing wheat prior to the sugar beets, you know, that's the best uh, uh, crop you can have for having minimal rhizoctonia. And I touched upon the other crop choice and wheat control. Um, if you look at the soybeans, exactly just like sugar beets, you know, the time you plant until harvest, you know, there's a risk for rhizoctonia, but I would say generally the risk is much higher uh, earlier during the growth of the soybeans. Again, you could see pre or post virgin damping off with soybeans, or uh, for example, in 2018, <laughs> In 2018, uh, when we planted soybeans, we also inoculated with rhizoctonia that's multiplied in the barley grains. And if you look at these two rows, basically we lost about 90 to 95% of the stands just because of this rhizoctonia AG2-2. And these two are uh, uh, non-inoculated ones. So there was no rhizoctonia here. But again, we got about an inch of rain right after planting. So that was pretty devastating, right? So if you end up planting your beans late and then the conditions are favorable, uh, that can actually wipe out uh, soybeans pretty good. And in 2019, the same trial, uh, we only lost about you know 30 to 40% of the stands here, but the conditions are not as favorable, but you can see the impact, you know, we'll, we lost some stands here. And if you look at navy beans uh, specifically, you know, in terms of the edible beans, we see the same pattern, right? You can see plants dying uh, up and down the row, and typically the one that emerged early and strong, you know, it has some tolerance to this compared to the other ones. The same pattern, you know, it looks pretty good, and you have a couple of dead plants right next to it. Again, these two, you know, early emerged, the, one of the later emerged plant was uh, more susceptible to rhizoctonia, right? So one thing I want to emphasize, whether it's a soybean or edible bean, I know you could just uh, look at this, not to go to publication, how to manage these. I don't know, probably some of these things are very common for Minnesota too. 
But the thing that I found interesting was the same fungicides that we have in sugar beets are also available in soybeans and edible beans, whether it's a seed treatment or infer fungicide or a foliar application. So I'm not going to say whether it's a quadrus or asteroid here because you know sometimes the formulations uh, come a standalone or in a combination. That's why I listed the active ingredient. So again, the seed treatments, they come in several different uh, uh, brand names. So please look into this. And I want to uh, switch gears and look at the Atlantic fungicides, right? It's the major development we have in sugar beets since 2014 was we have several seed treatments that were labeled, but most of them uh, belong to one class. It's called a succinate dehydrogenase inhibitor. So they target one single enzyme that's uh, essential for this pathogen. So it cannot uh, breathe, you know, almost you're choking that, right? So we have Cabina, Vibrans, or Cystiva, or Metlox suite with Cabina or Cystiva uh, Vibrans here, right? So these are the major ones. Uh, again, I listed Metconazole, the Metlox suite is not SDHI here. So some of the data from 2020, this trial was inoculated at the time of planting, right? So I have number of plants for 100 foot of row on Y axis and days after planting here on the X axis. So untreated, there was nothing on the seed here compared to this is the average for my seed treatments in this particular trial. So 2020, I would say we got good rain in Crookston, but the disease pressure was low to moderate, you know, early and then uh, going into the season. So the pattern that I saw in 2020 was a uh, little uncommon because typically I would have expected seed treatments, uh, you know, better uh, compared to untreated, but there was a slight standard action early on, but you know, they caught up with that. But as we go beyond nine to 10 weeks after planting, you know, both untreated control and seed treatments were losing, right? So I want to emphasize for seed treatments, the best protection for rhizoctonia is probably up to, you know, four to five weeks after planting, right? So don't count on them forever. And look at some infra fungicides. Uh, I think this is something I've been talking for the past two to three years. Again, uh, two points I want to emphasize here. Uh, when we apply these infra fungicides, these are applied down a drip tube, right? So it's just going into the furrow. And what we do is uh, we mix these fungicides in three gallons of water and then mix with three gallons of 1034O. So basically we are applying this in a six gallons per acre volume, right? So that's six gallons total. But you know, fungicide in water is only three gallons. And uh, depending on the choice of infra fungicides, you know, some mix very well with 1034O and some not so well. Uh, but again, here we mix these and they were just sitting on the bench for 10 minutes, but we never had any issues in applying these infra fungicides with 1034O because we have good agitation in our tank. And uh, if you have a good system set up, I think you'll be better off with any of one of these fungicides uh, that I showed here. So some of the fungicides we used in 2020, in a quadris nine and a half fluid ounce rate, an asteroid, it's very equivalent to quadris rate, and elatus, it's a combination of quadris and an SDHI fungicides. So that's it's got supplemental label in uh, January 2021. So you could actually use it for 2021. And xanthian is a combination of headline and uh, and a biological, and preaxer, it's a combination of headline and an SDHI. And proline, I know you all use it for Cercospora, and you could actually do that infra application. And propols, it's a combination of uh, prothiaconazole and flupiram. And I also included a quarter six fluid ounce uh, with the cabina. You know, ideally, I want you to use nine and a half fluid ounce. Uh, based on some lab studies, we could see some isolates of rhizoctonia are not really uh, that sensitive to azoxystrobin but still you could manage with the regular rate of quadris. Uh, but again, this is just for experimental purpose. I would like you to use nine and a half fluid ounce in the real world. And looking at the stand counts here, uh, basically I added my data for the infero treatments on top of the previous graph, right? So normally I would see inferos going a little bit lower early on compared to the seed treatments and they do very well uh, later towards uh, like a nine or 10 weeks after planting here, right? So that's the same pattern that we saw here. 
they tracked at least 10 to 15 beats. You know, we have some numbers here. When I share this presentation, you could take a closer look. So Inforos did very well. And the other pattern that I typically see with Inforos, you know, you may have a little bit of standard action early on, especially if it's dry or cool conditions, but then they, they do very well, uh, at least until uh, mid season. Based on the data we have, I think the protection lasts at least until uh, you know, 10 to 15th August. And looking at the data for the harvest, right? You know, we, we took the trial to the harvest and uh, I'm showing the recoverable sucrose per acre. Uh, my untreated here, and this is the recoverable sucrose uh, in pounds per acre and untreated control and most of the seed treatments by itself. You know, statistically, these are very similar, right? So the stands were good early on, but by the time harvest, you know, we lost more and more plants. So you cannot see much difference between these. And some of the best performing ones were actually uh, inferno treatments here. You know, most of these share letter A means statistically these are very similar, but you can see numerical differences among these treatments, right? The low rate of harvest with Cabina, it looked as good as uh, the regular rate, but I said just because of the risk of uh, developing resistance to quadris, I think it's better to avoid this kind of treatment here. And xanthian looked very good. You know, uh, propyls, proline and preaxor, a little bit lower, but statistically very similar. Whereas asteroid and elitis look pretty good, right? I'd be comfortable with any of these choices going forward. And I want to switch gears and talk about post-emergence fungicides now, right? So again, this trial was conducted uh, in Crookston here. Uh, I have the data for uh, two to three years uh, in my slides. So the only difference in this trial was uh, that we inoculated with Rhizoctonia sometime on uh, you know, June 23rd or 24th, and uh, we applied these post fungicides on it. So untreated, there was uh, no application on this. When we harvested, you know, I showed you that zero to 10 rating scale, you know, most of the beets were looking like a four, right? So a little bit on the lower end, actually. We got good rain in, uh, uh, June and then some in July, but still, you know, uh, after that it was a little bit dry. So we did not have uh, too much disease by the end of the season. And here I have the percent of the roots with some rhizoctonia on it. It, it could be one or 10. So 94% of the roots had some kind of rhizoctonia on them. And then I use this color code just to show you that if I looked at the, the statistical differences, uh, everything is very similar in terms of the percent of the roots with this one here, right? So quadris, if you do a post application, you would do a 14 and a half fluid ounce or elate a 7.1 asteroid, quadris at a lower rate, 10 fluid ounce. I think it looks more or less similar. In some years, uh, it's not as good as 14.5. You know, Excalia, this is a new SDHI from Valent. Uh, it's labeled in 2020. And the rate I have here is 0.64 fluid ounce. And if you do this as a seven inch band, you know, all of these fungicides uh, has to be applied in a seven inch band. I do have a quadris broadcast as 14.5 fluid ounce. And looking at the survey, at least 50% of you are doing broadcast and 50% as a band application. I would say, you know, broadcast is working but it's not as good as 14.5, right? I mean, statistically it's very similar, but when I, when I show you some data from uh, the recoverable sucrose per acre, my untreated control at 8,000 pounds, and you know, most of these in the blue font again from the previous slide, right? These are very similar, but look at the numerical difference, you know, 9846 compared to 10,500, right? So there's a good difference, but anything in this blue, uh, that looked very good in 2020. And if I go to the second tier, um, even preaxor and propulse, you know, all this with this black uh, parenthesis here, these are statistically very similar based on the 2020 data, right? So the, my first preference would be from this batch. And then if you have some fields with low to moderate risk, you know, you could go with anything in this, in this other bracket here. Again, the data from 2017, Although all the post fungicide side by side here, everything was applied as a band other than this quadris broadcast, the same trend, right? So asteroid and quadris uh, really on the top here 
and broadcast a little bit on the lower side and even top chord EQ. It's a combination of DMI and uh, also the quadris part that says oxystrobin. You now that, that looked good in 2017. Again, the data from 2019 here, my untreated about 3867, right? So we all remember the 2019 fall. I think, you know, that's like a once in a lifetime for a sugar beet grower. There was a lot of moisture uh, that messed up some of the disease ratings and uh, the disease development. But most of these in the blue font looked very good. Again, and see how the quad is 14.5 as a band versus broadcast, you know, how it's tracking on the higher and lower end, right? So. So again, the answer to the question, can you do the broadcast? Yes, but don't expect it to be as good as 14.5 when you do a band application. And uh, looking at the, some combination of the resistant varieties and also seed treatment, infra fungicide and the post application. So I call this as an integrated management trial. We had this trial in 2020 at three different locations. But the best data we got was from the Southern Minnesota. There was a lot of disease pressure. There was low to moderate disease pressure in Crookston. So we had two varieties, 3.7 and 4.4. You know, that's the best variety from uh, the crystal area here. That's the reason that was included. And susceptible one was about 4.4. For Atlantic treatments, there was uh, no seed treatment or infero, only cystiva as a seed treatment and uh, quadris infero with cystiva, right? And looking at the planting dates, more or less very similar for Southern Minnesota, a little bit later for the Crookston location. Uh, but when you look at the four and eight leaf post applications, these are uh, very similar for both locations. And this is uh, the timing that, you know, most of you are doing a post application here, right? Looking at the stands here, I have on the Y axis, the number of plants per 100 foot of row. And this after planting, this is at the Southern Minnesota now, numerically, the 3.7 variety did a little bit better, but you know, statistically, there is no difference between 3.7 and 4.4. And the key again, the rhizotonia resistance really does not kick in until the beets reach at least six leaf stage. And at planting treatments, you know, cystiva and cystiva with quadris, they looked very good, but once you move to five to seven weeks after planting, you can see cystiva and quadris. I mean, numerically it was tracking a little bit higher, but you know, statistically these two are very similar at the Southern Minnesota location. And untreated control, you know, we can see there's a good disease pressure. You know, we, we keep losing stands at this particular location for this. And some data between 3.7 and 4.4. Uh, this is for the harvest. Uh, looking at the sucrose, you know, a little bit higher sucrose in the resistant one because you know there's actually less root rot and also more recalibrate sucrose per ton and the final rating for rhizoctonia it was much lower for the resistant one compared to the susceptible one uh, the other pattern that we saw was uh, when we compared these at planting treatments really by the time of harvest when we looked at the data across two varieties we could not separate any of these parameters you know statistically but the major difference uh, we saw was in terms of the post-emergence application, right? So this is the four inch soil temperature from Renville location here. And 65, you know, this is the temperature we used to track prior to having seed treatments for rhizoctonia. But now my message has been, you know, don't worry about the 65 degrees anytime between four and eight leaf application and you're better off doing a post application here. Again, some of the dates for a four and eight leaf application. We will look at the results now, All right? This is from Southern Minnesota location. No post, four leaf and eight leaf post application here, right? So we looked at like June 12 or June 22nd for this. And look at the yield, no post 27. This is averaged across two varieties, 34 and 34, about seven tons increase. And you look at RSA about 2,400 pounds or untreated control or without post application at this location. But there is a big difference whether it's a 3.7 or a 4.4 variety. You know, since it has the, the genetic resistance for rhizoctonia, there is a little bit increase in the resistant variety about five tons compared to the susceptible one, whether it's a four or eight leaf application, there's like a 10 tons per acre bump. But again, this was a little bit severe 
in terms of disease development when we harvested this trial. If you're curious to look at the recoverable sucrose per acre for the resistant variety, about 1,700 pounds for both four or eight leaf application, there is a susceptible one about 2,400 pounds over no post application, right? And initially when I described these trials, I said the one at Crookston location was not as severe. We got probably low to moderate disease by the end. Here you can see a bump at least from 7,500 to 8,000 RSA with four leaf or about 7,900 with the eight leaf application, right? A little bit bump, but again, it has better tolerance for rhizoctonia compared to the susceptible one about 900 to you know 1200 pounds increase depending on four or eight leaf application. So we did see a benefit from post application at Crookston location. The same thing was observed in 2019. So typically I see the response from a post application, you know, when, whenever uh, the July and August, you know, if it's a little bit on the wet side and the conditions are favorable for rhizoctonia development. With that, the take home message for 2021, you know, the varieties, I think 75% of you said you're using a specialty variety for rhizoctonia. You know, it will pay off, especially if you have moderate to high disease pressure, but don't expect to see, you know, much benefit if you have low to moderate pressure. And seed treatments, most of the seed treatments that we have labeled right now for rhizoctonia, they do an excellent job, but, you know, count on them for only uh, four to five weeks or at most, you know, five to six. And in for fungicides, the key for this is uh, the protection will last at least until the mid season if you do the in application. But if you have light soils or, you know, if the conditions are cooler or drier during the emergence, they could hurt some stands. But the thing we observed was if you have severe rhizoctonia, and you know, the benefits of infero fungicide are, are actually better than some of the risks that you have. And when it comes to post-emergence application, I would say 48 leaf application, you know, just go ahead and do your post. The other question we keep getting is, okay, do I need to wait for rain for doing my post application? I would say, just please go ahead and do your post application. Don't count on rain. You know, if it rains, I think it's good, but it's good if it does not rain too, but it's good to put your post application. Again, do you see any benefit from post? I would say yes, but it depends on July and August weather, right? You know, that's gonna drive how the rest of the season is going to look for you. And the resistant variety, oftentimes, if you have low disease pressure, you may not see some benefit, but especially from moderate to severe disease pressure, you will see a benefit just like uh, what we have seen in 2020 and 2019. And uh, for the best management practice, I think most of you were doing already based on the survey, you know, go with the seed treatment and a post application. You know, this is best for you know, low to moderate disease pressure situations. But I think if you have a severe field for rhizoctonia, I would say go with the seed treatment and infero fungicide and do a post application, right? I think one post would be enough if you do both C treatment and infero application there. And this is the chart I put together. So basically these are different options that you have for C treatment right now in the market. I did not list the combinations here because you know that will be repetitive and the infero and then the post fungicides. And I did some color coding for this, you know, SDHIs and you have QOIs, and then you have a bi biological here, and some of these are DMIs. And the only difference here is the metalox with the rhizolex component, you know, that's an aromatic hydrocarbon, that's AH, and again, some of the post fungicides, right? So if you are concerned about using the same fungicide in for and post, you know, this chart will really will be helpful for you to see if you want, let's say you have a SDHIC treatment maybe go with the uh, infra of the QOI or come back with uh, something different. Again, SDHA or post, right? But if you look at the lifestyle for rhizoctonia, you know, it, it has just like a one life cycle. It's not like Sarcastra because it just wakes up, it kills beets. And at the end of the season, it will go into dormant sclerotia. It will start its cycle next season, right? So the risk for developing resistance is low, but 
I think it's a good practice to rotate whenever you have an opportunity to rotate these fungicides. With that, I would like to thank the r &D board for funding this work and, uh, and the co-ops. Uh, I could not have done this work without their help and all the seed companies and then uh, chemical industries for uh, generously providing uh, supplies for this. And uh, most thanks to my team, you know, 2020, we know how difficult it was to do anything. So they went above and beyond to get this stuff done. I'm very thankful for them. Again, my contact information here. I'll be happy to take any questions uh, right now or during the uh, rest of the meeting via chat. And this is a QR code to get some of the credits for you. Thank you. All right, good morning and uh, thank you for being here. Today I will discuss the strategies to manage sarcos for release spot. And I will touch at the end very briefly a new problem that we have in some areas, white mold. So you just completed a survey and your major problem you indicated was sarcos for release spot. Uh, this is a problem for growers, especially in the South at Southern Minnesota at Mindac and even now in the American Crystal area. These are some pictures of field that were severely impacted with sarcospha leaf spot. On the left one from Southern Minnesota, on the right one from Mindac that was sprayed five times. And in this past growing season in 2020, unfortunately, we saw some fields looking like the one on the left um, in places like Moorhead and in the Northern factory districts such as Ada. What can we do to manage this disease? What are you doing? For the most part, most growers are following the recommendations for managing this disease. The first thing that we normally say is, we should all practice crop rotation and we all do. Uh, in American crystal area, one of the things that you do that I, I wish everybody else could do is plant wheat or a barley crop before sugar beet. That's one of the best production practices uh, that one can engage in to reduce inoculum pressure and other diseases of sugar beet. So I think over 90% of you based on the survey are planting a week before sugar beet. So yes, you're all employing crop rotation. One has to be careful and this will come on back again to avoid planting edible beans, soybeans, you don't use canola or even sunflower, any crop that is a host for white mold as well, especially if you have a wet year uh, for the, the preceding crop. We'll come back to this a little bit later. So continue to include your wheat as the preceding crop before sugar beet. What else are you doing? We recommend tillage. One of the questions was, should it be deploying? No, anything that you can do to incorporate the residue. If, if it's two inches or three inches is deep, that will be fine. Most of you will probably have a disc doing a little bit of tillage, some tillage. So just by incorporating the residue, that will help in reducing the inoculum pressure. Right now, the inoculum pressure is very, very high, especially in the Southern and the central part of the American growing area but the wind I'm sure is taking some of the inoculum um, further north as well. So continue to do your tillage operation. It helps in reducing inoculum load. What else is available? This picture here shows a coded variety trial in September. This trial was not treated with any fungicide. And what I'm talking about is this area here. Uh, these are varieties that have been approved already. These are new varieties. Some of this, these varieties will be coming to American Crystal area, some probably in 2021 and more in 2022. You can see even in September, some of these varieties are still green without any fungicides. Uh, this is some varieties that were approved in the Mindac area. Picture was taken in September without any fungicide and you can see uh, even without any fungicides. These varieties are performing very well. Some are, of these varieties are approved for Mindac area. Some of these are in the pipeline from, from beta seed, from ACH seed, 
There is one from Cesc van der Have. There was another one, um, uh, Emmy, also in the pipeline, the Maribu, one of the Maribu varieties. So we're hoping that more of these varieties will also become available for American crystal growers. And we'll discuss why variety varieties are important, improve leaf spot varieties. What else are you doing that we recommend? You use fungicides. And I was very happy to see over 89% of you indicated that you use a fungicide mixture. Some people went on very late with a late application because you didn't want to have any issue later in the season. And in those instances, uh, a grower may tend to use just one fungicide, one fungicide alone and not a mixture. The water volume, we are doing some work. And right now, the high water volume of about 15 to 20 gallons per acre. Uh, we use 80 PSI in our research, but a lot of the work that we've done was at 60 PSI. So anything above 60 PSI with about 15 to 20 gallons of water will deliver the fungicides. In a normal year, and we'll talk about more what is normal, what is not so normal. If you can apply your fungicides without getting much rainfall, you can have 14 days of excellent control. If you have too much of rainfall as happened in 2020, then you need to shorten your interval to 10 or 12 days. We'll talk more about that, but if you apply your fungicides and they're washed off by rainfall, then you can have more severe disease. And so that is what we saw in 2020. I will show you some slides of the leaf spot what has happened over time, how the population has increased, how the population has shifted from sensitive to resistant. So on the left-hand side, this is a picture of the sugar beet field on August the 29th, showing you a lot of brown leaves. And note in the picture, which leaves are the ones that are killed, which ones are brown? The oldest leaves, and they tend to be the most productive leaves. When these leaves die, what the plant does, as it looks here two weeks later, it looks green, it looks beautiful. But what the plant is trying to do is to regain its growth, re continue with life. And it does that by using the sucrose that was stored in the roots. So what happens now is that not only your tonnage will be reduced because the plant is using all its energy, all its photosynthes photosynthetic capacity to produce new leaves, rather than to produce sucrose, which is stored in the roots. In addition, in addition, when you have these leaves that are killed, you have toxin that goes in the leaves, and this results in high amino N, which reduces your sugar concentration. So you want to avoid this from happening. For many years, headline, which is a constituent of Pryaxor, was our best fungicides. This product became available it was labeled in 2002, became available in 2003, and until 2015 was one of our best fungicides. But as in this picture here shows, it doesn't matter if it's headline mixed with a SDHI, fluoxapyroxide, GEM, which is trifluxystrobin, or Pyrac, none of these QOIs are working. And the reason is over 90% of our Sarcospora vertical population have become resistant to the fungus by just a change of one gene at position 143. What happens two weeks later? As I showed you earlier, the brown leaves are gone. They're gone to the ground. You have regrowth of leaves. And what happens is that your yield will be a little bit higher than your check. But these leaf spot rating, of course, will be 10. And you're not accustomed to get the high yields and the high quality sugar you're getting by using the QOIs. So for the most part, we're saying stay away from the QOI, use other mode of action, and hopefully we can get our population back again, whereby we can probably come back with a QOI at least once in a season in a mixture. We'll talk more about this later. What else is happening? So we were fortunate that in 1999, the year after the 1998 epidemic, we had Eminent. Eminent was one of our best fungicides. Of course, you have Eminent in the form of uh, Eminent, you have it in the form of Minerva, you have it in the form of Minerva Duo. When this fungicide came out, 
it was very, very effective and it remained effective for a number of years. But what we have seen with triazoles is that if you use triazoles over and over again to spray sarcospora, after a time, the population starts to shift, you have reduced sensitivity, so the fungicide is not as effective as, as it once were. So we then use other triazoles like Inspire XT, which is a mixture of two. Flutriafol came on the market, but it was never very effective. And Minerva, Inspire, and then came Proline, and those fungicides were just as good as Headline. But in 2016, what was happening was the population became resistant to the QOIs and less sensitive to the triazoles. So you can see in this picture here, the Minerva was working a little bit better than Inspire and the Flutriafol was very, very ineffective. So although they're all triazoles, they're impacting the sterols in the fungus, they are not working well and each one has its own level of efficacy. I have here a slide which shows you the non-treated check is 10 on a one to 10 scale, which means that the old, all the sleeves are killed, you have regrowth. That happened in non-treated check, that happened with Priaxor. Eminent, Minerva, Inspire and Proline, along with Priaxor, previous to 2016, will give us leaf spot rating of lower than six, which will mean you may have a, a slight amount of leaf spot, but you're not having economic damage. Now, you may not have statistical difference sometimes, sometimes you do, you might have a bump in yield, but rather than <clears throat> getting eight and 9,000 pounds of recoverable sucrose per acre for these treatments, you're only getting about five to 6,000 pounds because of reduced efficacy. Some years, depending on, on the amount of rainfall, the triazoles may work better than other years. It seems that if you have less rainfall after the fungicide application, you have better efficacy. The DMIs, this was in 2017, you can see Eminent was not doing very well. Inspire was doing a little bit better and Proline was doing also better than the Eminent. As I said, each one has its own different intrinsic activity and they behave differently. Yesterday, there was a question at Mindac, which is one, which the question was, which is our most effective triazole at this point in time? And we have about six or seven of them labeled. Consistently, Proline is the one that is the best by itself, but we do not recommend using any one of these alone. I just showed you 2017, this is 2019, when we had less rainfall, although we had lots of disease in the check, because the fungicides were able to be effective, you had better disease control with the triazoles. Here again, we're still not recommending using them alone. I put a slide here to show you what happened in a dry year, and this is what happened in a dry year versus what happens in a wet year. In the dry year, the non-treated check is still high. However, the triazoles were working much more effectively in 2019. You had 8,000 pounds of recoverable sucrose. In 2017, you can see the leaf spot rating became even worse and your yield became lower as well. So you have two things are happening. There's fungicide sensitivity, and then once the fungus population becomes very high, the fungicides are not able to control it, especially, especially when you have more rainfall after fungicide application. And I will show you a few slides later, what happens when you have really, really wet conditions as um, using 2020 as an example. Now, what works for us? Right now, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, since we've had the population shift in 2016, tin by itself has continued to be our most effective fungicide. Tin by itself is our most effective fungicide. However, we shall not be using it alone. And this will be our mantra for today. So that's tin by itself. This is proline on the top. Two weeks later, by itself, not too bad, but you can see some brown leaves. If you put tin and proline, works wonderful, even two weeks later. Now, 
The question is, one question we've had, since proline and tin look so effective at controlling the disease, why don't we use this mixture early in the season? If you're at American Crystal in the Grafton area, and you're only doing maybe one or two applications, of course, you can probably use a proline and a tin, and then you don't have that much issues with the resistance in the northern part of the valley. You can use another mixture in your second application. If you need to use a third one, you have another option again because you can use three applications of tin. However, when you did your survey just now, many of you had four, five, and a few people had six applications. Let's say you have to use four or five applications. Since you can only use three applications of tin, what we're saying is to use your tin and your, pro, your triazoles as your aces, and then mix those with either a copper or an EBDC or maybe a topsin. So you always have one of the good ones in the applications. We'll come back to this a little bit later. It doesn't only work for proline, inspire by itself, will give you fear control, but you add tin to it, it looks better. The same thing goes to Minerva by itself, not so good, but with tin, much better. And please note, these pictures are pictures of plots that are treated with one fungicide multiple times. We do not recommend this for growers. This is just what we want to be doing to find out which fungicides or mixtures are effective. We'll come to mixtures and a rotation program shortly. The data also shows the same thing that you saw in the picture. The triazoles by themselves in a dry year are doing well, but if you add tin to them, they do better and you get higher recoverable sucrose per acre. We're shooting for about eight to 9,000 pounds or even more per acre. Now, is there anything else we can use? Because if you're saying we have tin, which is working very well, the triazoles are not working so, so well and we need to mix those with something else. What can, what can we use? We're saying use the multi-site. Tin is also considered as a multi-site. The triazoles and the strobilurins or the QOIs are considered as site-specific. So you can see here again, the check is 9.8 with 5,000 pounds of recoverable sucrose. If you use an, any one of the EBDC, manzate or ditane, you get Leaf spot rating lower than six, that means it's not causing much economical damage or copper by itself or a mixture of a copper and an EBDC, good leaf spot control or fair leaf spot control and high and acceptable recoverable sucrose per acre. So the EBDCs and the coppers are more or less the multi-site fungicides. They do not and have never worked as effectively as the site-specific fungicides when the site-specific fungicides were new. And the reason is because they are not site-specific. They kill the fungus by acting in many different ways. However, one of the good things about the multi-site fungicide is that the fungus is usually unable to develop resistance to these fungicides. So we use them to control the fungus and to manage fungicide resistance. Here you can see a mixture of Manzate and Inspire. You saw Tin and Inspire work well. Well, so does Manzate and Inspire. Badge and Inspire, a Copper and Inspire also work well. One question I had was, well, if you use Badge, does it affect your, your tubings if it's aluminum? The truth is, I don't know. We do a lot of trials every year. We have not seen any damage. What I will recommend when you're using any copper product the copper products work well when the pH is a little bit on the lower side, 6, 6.5. You don't want it to become too acid, acidic. The more acidic it becomes, the more effective the fungicide becomes, and it can become so effective that it becomes phytotoxic. So you have to be careful. Use it according to the label, and you should be fine. You can also use mixtures, especially in the northern end of the valley. You can use a copper and an EBDC if you want to try to get rid of strobilurin and triazole resistant isolates. One treatment which has worked well for many years, especially as you go from Grand Forks to north, is a mixture of tin and topsin. 
Topsin by itself is not very fitness issue. However, if you want to start with a, one of your best treatment, I've shown you already, Kin is working well. Do not use the six ounces. All of this is looking good. You do not want to put additional pressure on your tin. Use eight ounces and 10 to 20 ounces of topsin. What will happen is if you have a rainfall after your application, it will wash your tin off. But topsin is systemic and it will have to provide some control. So for over 20 years, this treatment here applied early in the season, usually in the first application, typically end up with good CLS control for the remainder of the year and high recoverable sucrose content. If you really want to get after your, your, uh, your population that is resistant, you have Minerva Duo, especially people in the north, if you're using less applications, you can use a Minerva Duo and a badge. So that's three modes of action or a Minerva Duo and EBDC. What you're doing here, you're controlling your fungal population and you're managing resistance. Plus you get excellent disease control, which will result in high yield and high sugar concentration. Now, all I've been discussing for the most part is which fungicides or fin fungicide mixtures work well. We have done a lot of rotation program whereby we put mixtures in a rotation and then see what happens. And I'll show you 2019, we had an untreated check. Our price was not very good. So we got just $500 per acre. And if you use fungicides, a triazole with an EBDC, a tin with a benzimidazole or a tiophanate methyl, a triazole with an EBDC. And what we're doing here, we're never using the same mode of action. We're changing things up. So we're showing the fungus different modes of action, trying to use different modes of action to kill the population that we have. You have high, uh, high recoverable sucrose, over $300 more per acre after you will have paid for your fungicide application. You can also use super tin and a copper and a copper and an EBDC and still get good control. But as you can see, as I said earlier, 2019 was a relatively dry year and we had good conditions after applying the fungicides. But this was the mantra. I start applying your fungicides and this one started early at row closure. You have one, two, three, four application in a mixture. You have excellent disease control. Here again, I'm showing you pictures of different mixtures using a rotation program followed by tin and topsin. I always prefer my tin topsin first, but this will also work. Proline and amanzate, a copper and EBDC, and at American Crystal, you like to use a Priax or a Priax or a tin. <clears throat> you can see excellent disease control compared to your check. If you change it around here, rather than Inspire and Amanzate, you can put two of your best, Inspire and tin. But you're coming back here with a tin and a topsin, another triazole, and a copper and an EBDC. Here again, excellent disease control. This happens if you have a, these varieties that I'm using here <clears throat> have a rating of 5.0. 5.0, I don't think any grower is using 5.0 ratings. <clears throat> so these are very susceptible, but you have excellent control in dry years. In wet years is a different story. In 2018 and 2019, without using a QOI or a triazole, just using tin and an EBDC, an EBDC and copper in a rotation program in 2018. You can see green leaves compared to the check. In 2019, this variety here was a little bit different, a little bit more yellow, but still leaf spot rating was very low with high yield, just by using more or less the multi-sites in mixtures. And this can work fairly well for growers from Crookston going north. Now in 2020, just like 2016 was a wet year. <clears throat> Where we did our research in Fox Home, we had about 70 days where we applied fungicide. In 25 of those 70 days, in 25 of those 70 days, 
we had rain. So that meant that most of the time after applying the fungicide, a lot of times within two days, we had a heavy rainfall. And what happened, you will see in a lot of this area where it's kind of yellow, which became brown later on, you had varieties that were 5.0. And anywhere that you see green, it's not only fungicides, but more or less in this coded variety trial here, there were no fungicides, but you can see the varieties are still doing well because of inherent resistance. This was August the 25th. This is August the 2nd. You can see more green here. And as you come two weeks later on, there is less green, but there are still some varieties that are resistant. You look here, there is more and more brown. Never mind, we were applying fungicides. Fungicides were applied in this area here until September 4th. But if you had a fairly susceptible variety, five or higher, you were not getting control because the fungicides were being washed off. I come a little bit closer. If we look at this one trial here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six treatments going all the way down. One of these here, this one here will be your check. The other five were treated. All of these other ones here have a check, but I cannot see the check visually because it's not colored differently, it's not brown. Here, how can you know where your check is? If you look carefully, you will see that your, your check, usually there is no um, wheel tracks going through here, no wheel tracks going through here, so one of these here will be your checks. The reason why this here looks so green, we got an experimental, experimental variety that is very tolerant to sarcosperly spot, and we use from one to six fungicide application, from zero to six fungicide application. And you couldn't see the difference between zero and six because this variety was so good at tolerating the disease. If you come to this next trial here, you'll see a lot of brown and you'll see some green. And I'll come back to ask you if you can kind of differentiate among the different varieties. Okay, so we have four varieties in the trial that I showed you I just showed you, let me go back. So this is the trial here. I've taken out some pictures of these plots and I'm asking you, keep in your mind, tell me out of, this is variety A, variety B, variety C and variety D. Which one to you visually looks the best for leaf spot control? Will it be A? B, C, or D? I don't know what your answer is, but based on what I'm seeing, and then based on the recoverable sucrose, so I have that advantage, variety D here look the best. Visually, and in terms of yield, because it looks so much better, it was also one of those varieties that, that did well in recoverable sucrose. Now I will ask you, if you were to compare variety A, B, C, and D, which one do you think had the most fungicide application? Which one do you think had the most fungicide application? A, B, C, or D? And before you answer your question, the heading of my slide is effect of host resistance on leaf spot control. So variety A, B, C, and D, each one of these here has a different level of tolerance to leaf spot. Each one of them had a different level of tolerance to leaf spot. This one here was the most resistant. So what happened, if you were to say maybe D had the most fungicide, that's not correct. All of them had the exact same number of four fungicide applications. However, because variety D was more tolerant to the disease, the fungicide along with, with its natural inherent resistance result in this one looking the best. So when you have a wet year, when you have a wet year, I'll so show you some more data. You need more resistant varieties. And I think as a whole, that's where uh, the, show, the seed companies are going over time. This here is what happened at Fox. So in a variety that was five, just concentrate in the first one, two, three, four ranges. This here was taken from September 2nd September 24th, and you can kind of see here, 
If you look in this picture, you can still see some foliage at the top here. Some of those were still looking fairly well on September 2nd. But two weeks later, before we harvested, it was difficult to pick out which treatment was better than the other because at that time, by the 24th, by as a matter of fact, the last application was made on the 4th. And then after that time, everything went downhill because the leaf spot control was not very effective because they were being washed away by numerous amount of rainfall. Now, so in a very wet year, this is what happened. The non-treated check was 10, the leaf spot rating. The sugar was 12.8. And the highest, the highest yield that we had in the best treatment, this was our best treatment with about six or seven applications. When this one started to be 10, this one was still 5.5. You can see the sugar was still very good, surprisingly. 17.8% sugar, which was actually higher than the tonnage. The tons was just about 17 tons. That was the highest tons we had at this site here in 2020, with about 5,000 pounds of recovered sucrose. So if you're gonna go with a very susceptible variety in a wet year, no matter how many times we sprayed, we could not control the disease. This was the second best treatment. And all of those treatments here, you can see, if you go into the research production report, when you see these three asterisks, it's telling us that we started applying the fungicides as soon as the rows were closed, as soon as the rows were closed. Even if we did that, it didn't matter because by the end of the season, these fives also became 10, just like the non-treated check. The sugar remained fairly good for these here between about 15 to 17.8%. But look what leaf spot can do. In addition to reducing your tonnage, we'll talk about tonnage, but you can easily get 6% reduction, 6% reduction in sugar concentration if you do not do anything because of leaf spot. Another treatment that worked very well, and what we were seeing was that any mixture, any mixture for the most part of most triazoles or tin with another product, and you put about six or seven application, you'll get fairly good control early in the season, but then your sugar start to go down and your recovery sucrose. So we were getting about 17 tons in this resort site where we had about five tons, where we had about um, the, the this spot rating of five. Most growers will not have this. What did the growers get in the Mindak area? They got about 24 tons per acre, 24 tons per acre and just under 17% sugar. So overall, this was Mindak's average for 2020 where this trial was done. Remember I told you earlier, we used one of those varieties that was very resistant to leaf, resistant to leaf spot you had a check, which you could not differentiate. And you can see here, we've just had a few spots here and there. And it didn't matter if you put six application or five application or two applications at different times or three applications or two. This was one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five and at a check. The leaf spot rating was, the highest was two, which meant you hardly had any spots. Even if you didn't put any fungicides, your yield was about 26 tons to about 28 tons. And your sugar concentration was anywhere between 17 to 17.8 tons. And your check was just as good as more or less some of your fungicide treatment. So you had anywhere between 8,000 to 9,000 pounds of recoverable sucrose per acre, even when you did not use any fungicide. I don't know what the variety is. The the company just gave me an experimental, but this is the trend of things to come. High yielding variety, good sugar, and good resistance to leaf spot. Uh, we didn't check for resistance to other diseases, so that will be another package we'll kind of look at. Hopefully, we'll start to get more of these varieties in uh, 2021. Another thing we did, we were I was trying to get varieties from the different sugar comp seed companies with different germplasm that were developing these newer generation of leaf spot varieties. Unfortunately, unfortunately, because they were ramping up seed production so that you, the grower, can have more varieties earlier and faster, they didn't have enough to share with me. So all I could muster was from one company, and this was from Beta Seed, 
what I did, and just look at the force range. You have four reps, this is replicated. So whatever you're seeing here is somewhere else. It's just looking here, it's probably one of these. This one is here, probably here, here, and somewhere else. So the same thing, whatever you're finding in this force range is randomized. So these two are commercially available varieties. This, I'll show you the ratings. Uh, this is about 4.8. This is about 4.4. This one here is a more tolerant variety, not approved. They just gave me this. And this is a new generation variety. The first one, two, three, four, five treatments in the first range, they had fungicides. Most of them will have had four or five fungicide applications. The last one, treatment six in each one is an untreated check. So you have a check here, check, check, and a check. You can see this tolerant variety. There is no tracks going through there, more or less. Without any fungicide, towards the end of September, is doing, still doing very well. The more susceptible variety, as I said, some of these had about six fungicide application. We tried to put on some of the treatment despite the rainfall. We just went in there, or Peter went in and did it. But still, at the end of the season, we couldn't control the disease. I'll mm -hmm. sure share some of the data <clears throat> with you. I'll show you here a video. Remember the first five plots you see will be treated plots and number six will be a check. So let's go. Starting, so one, two, three, four, and five. The middle four rows are treated. You can see the guest rows and untreated check. Then the next set will be again, one, two, three, four and five, and you can see the guest rows. This is your check coming up here now. That's your check. Those are susceptible varieties. One, two, three, four, five, a more tolerant variety with sprays. This is the check. And then an experimental variety. One, two, three, four, and then the last one, is here, you can see there was really no tracks going through. Looks a little bit more pale yellow than let's say the ones that had fungicide. And uh, this was our data. So I can, as I told you, this was an untreated check for variety A, no treatment was 5,000 pounds. Variety B, which was a little bit more tolerant, just under 5,000 pounds. Variety C, under CLS rating of four, 6,000 pounds and variety D with no fungicides, 9,000 pounds. And if you put four or five or six fungicides, uh, we had, as you saw from the pictures, a little bit of rain, too much rainfall. So, so a few plots had some water damage, but the yield range from about 8,000 to 10,000 pounds of recoverable sucrose for, for this experimental variety. Another variety that is more or less experimental as well, 7,000 to 9,500 pounds. Uh, this one here didn't do so well in the absence of fungicides. And these two commercial varieties, as I said, even if we put on four or five or six fungicide applications, our highest yield was about 7,000 pounds. And so one has to be careful. The lesson here is that when you're gonna start planting in April, we do not know what kind of a rainfall pattern we will be having. Even if you apply fungicides every two weeks, if it's, there is no rainfall, you will get a good crop, good disease control. But if this wet trend continues as we had in 2020, then when you're selecting the lower resistant varieties, one has to be careful. We're hoping that more and more varieties will be coming at 4.3 and lower. So you will be having access to those. And not only will they have resistance to Sarcospora leaf spot, but they will also have resistance to Rhizoctonia and the other diseases we have. One of the things I liked in that picture that I showed you initially from Mindac was that at that site, we did have Rhizoctonia. But even in September, in those plots where the varieties were more or less approved, Although they did not have fungicides, they did not have Rhizox. So it is telling us that some of those varieties also have some good resistance to Rhizox. 
So hopefully uh, this trend will continue thanks to the seed companies for producing these varieties and we'll get more and more of these as time goes by. One question that came up yesterday, is there anything new in the pipeline? No, there is nothing new in the pipeline. However, I have done some work with some funding from the r &E board where we use chlorothalonil. By itself, it gives you fair control similar to an EBDC. However, when you mix just if you mix it with Priaxor, which you like to do in American crystal area, or you mix it with Proline, you have excellent disease control and high recoverable sucrose per acre. After our meeting yesterday, I had a call from a chemical company that are still interested in getting this product labeled for you. So I will be working with them to see if we can get this worked out. They still need to get an inhalation study worked out. Once that can be approved, then we're hoping to get this product probably in 2022 or 2023. So we've talked a lot about Sarcospora. What I would like us to remember are just a few things. Most of you, most of you are doing a great job. If something didn't work, it was probably not your fault. It was more or less because of the rainfall you had. Continue to use a holistic system. You're all using crop rotation. Try to avoid try to avoid any crop that will have or be a host for white mold, soybean or edible beans. Not too many of you have sunflower. You already do some tillage, so incorporate your deb debris. We know we have resistance issue. If you're gonna use a Priaxor, mix it with something else. Our best products are the tins and the triazos. Those are our aces always mix them with something else, either an EBDC, a copper, or early in the season, maybe in the first application, feel free to use a tin. Don't be afraid to use water, 15 to 20 gallons of water. Um, right now, we've been using 80 PSI, but all our other trials, we use 60 PSI and we have excellent control under favorable conditions. If you're gonna start if you are using susceptible variety, especially in the crystal area, make sure you start your fungicide applications earlier. Why? We have seen over the past several years that leaf spot can become very, very damaging. It doesn't matter if you're in uh, Moorhead or Ada or the northern end of the valley. And the reason is the population is very high. So if you have a more susceptible variety, uh, anything like a 4.5 or a 4.8, start at row closure, start at row closure. If this disease gets out of hand because it's multi-cyclic, every 10 to 12 days, you can have a new generation. It's difficult to play catch up. And especially if let's say you spray and then uh, you get a rainfall and it delays your interval to about 28 days, there is no way we can play catch up. As we recommend, go to shorter applications during wet intervals. If you have a rainfall probably less than 48 hours after fungicide application, it's hurtful to tell you this, but you may need to go back again and put on another fungicide as soon as it dries up. If you're expecting rain, one of the things you try to do in your application is to use a triazole. Use a triazole because it is systemic. So your other fungicide, your mixture partner, even if it's washed off, your triazole and your, EB, your topsin, those are systemic, they will still be able to give you some protection. More resistant varieties are coming. Some of them 1.8, some of them 2.5 CLS rating. Uh, these will probably need less fungicides. Uh, for the next growing season, I hope to get improved varieties from the different seed companies and work out when will be the best time uh, to apply fungicides so that we can still get high yields and not spend too, money, too much money on fungicides, but not end up into issues of resistance. Now, so that's my take on Sarcospora. I will now touch briefly on white mold. Uh, white mold in sugar beet was not common until 2019. We found it in 2019 for the first time. Uh, this is a picture from Hector, Minnesota. What happens, the lowest leaves get infected. They're the ones that die earliest. And you can see this is what your field looks like. One distinguishing symptomology is this darkening in the midrib here, in the petiole and in the midrib. 
Your roots look healthy on the outside and on the inside. And if we bring the samples in, grow them on a PDA and inoculate leaves, this is what happens. The infection spreads from the tip of the leaf or from where you have it, and it goes all the way to the crown. This same pathogen is also very pathogenic, not only in sugar beet, but it will also affect your uh, sunflower, your soybean, and pinto beans. So likewise, if you have these crops before sugar beet, you are setting up yourself for problems because this carotia can be in the soil for several years. We've done some work already in the greenhouse, in the lab, and we are, I'm happy to say that Priaxor and Proline, compared to the control, you can see the control here, the fungus has grown, it's all white, looks fairly good at controlling the disease, Vortisan as well, but we don't use this that much. And Dura, another product from BASF Boscalid, look fairly well, uh, but Topsin, I was disappointed in it because it doesn't look much different from the check. Uh, this is in the greenhouse. This is in the lab. We'll see what happens in the field. And what we also did, we used a lot of triazoles. Eminent, Proline, Vortisan. This is a SDHI. Inspire looked pretty good. But it, it, uh, this is Diphenconazole by itself. It seems if you put two different modes of action, Proline and Inspire, excellent control, Diphenconazole and Minerva, also excellent control. So we're hoping to get funding so we can do more work in the field and then we can give you some form recommendations. One of the questions I had, which I couldn't answer, but since you have much more experience than I do, was does white mold affect yield and quality? These are pictures from four different areas, four different varieties, A, B, C, D, some are a little bit more green, but you can see the damage here. Later on today, I'll give you an evaluation. And one of the questions I have there is, do you think based on these pictures, this was late September, October, and the disease started in August. Do you think based on what you're seeing here that white mold in sugar beet is impacting your yield and your quality? With that, I will say try to avoid soybeans or edible beans before sugar beet. Hopefully, once we get some funding and do some trials, we can be better able to tell you what you can use for fungicides for controlling this disease. This here is your CEU. Um, you can take a picture of this um, QR code so you can get your uh, two CEUs. And with that, I've gone over my time a little bit. I would like to say thank you to you, the growers, for funding my research, Seed and Chemical and Allied Industry for providing all my inputs. Luke Skansgard, especially for taking lots of aerial pictures. Bruce Sundin as well from Act Communication. Kevin Etzler for allowing us to do all this work on his farm. The people at the East Grand Forks Tear Lab, Tear Lab who do a phenomenal job of analyzing all of our samples at NDSU. My colleagues who do a phenomenal job of harvesting thousands of plots. And Peter Hack, my students and field interns for making or doing all the hard work and making it possible for us to get recommendations for you day in, day out. This is my um, email and address and telephone numbers. Any question? If you don't have questions, you can go into the chat box. Anything there, Tom? Yes, there are. There's there's three que or two questions and a comment. So let's try to do these quickly, Mohammed. Um, Glenn asked the question, I don't see Provisol in your trials. How does Provisol compare to other triazoles? We've been using the triazoles by themselves for a number of years. And based on the research, I will say Proline is number one, Inspire number two, and everything else comes afterward. Minerva, Provisol, Lucento, which has an SDHI in it. Um, however, we're not recommending the application of any of these fungicide alone. We're always recommending using different ones with either an EBDC or a copper. Next question. Okay, this is from Mark, and I'm going to read this, uh, Mohammed. With copper and EDBC not being resistant and fairly cheap compared to other fungicides that are resistant, have you tried just using EBDC and or copper alone with four to six times and skipping the uh, expensive resistant fungicides? Yes, and if you go back, we will make this um, these um, 
presentation is available to you. Towards the end of my uh, slides there, when I showed you 2018 and 2019, I used tin, I used copper, and I used EBDC in mixtures. That worked well. And then another time, I think I just used EBDC and copper for applications. And this will work especially, especially as you go more north. I will say from Crookston going north where the population is a little bit less um, higher than let's say Moorhead. This was at Foxwoman, you had excellent control. So if you don't have much of a rainfall, that would be one strategy to lower or even eliminate your population of resistant isolates. And it, it worked well, plus it's very, very economical. It may be one of the strategies for us to use when we do get the more resistant varieties to reduce our cost of operations. Mohammed, Cam wants you to compare headline and headline SC. Headline and headline SC. In most of our treatments, we were using headline SC for a long time. Before that, we were using headline EC. And then um, BASF said there won't be any more EC. Then they became SC. I think the EC was better when we were using it in Foro, if I remember correctly. But right now, as far as I know, there shall not be officially any more headline coming from BASF. There was one called Pyrac that was on the market for a short while, but I think that company went under. So if you have anything, it might be uh, old stocks. And if you need further information, the best people will be BASF, Ken Dibert, will be able to give you more information. In terms of efficacy, we didn't see much difference between headline EC and headline SC. Anything else, Tom? Yeah, I've got a, a comment from Ashok, so both of you can weigh in on this. Um, Ashuk's comment is, is some of the commercial varieties that are strong Sacospora varieties tend to be a little weaker on, on Rhizoc. So Ashuk is, is advocating for using a, a Rhizoc program post-emergence. I agree fully. You got to look at the whole farm operation, look at what else you have. Um, if you don't have much leaf spot in your area, Let's say you're in the northern part of the valley in Grafton, but you have more rhizoc and more aphanomyces, I'll say aim at those, those will be your big problems, not leaf spot. If you are more or less in Grand Forks where leaf spot can kind of take over, then you will need some varieties that will probably have leaf spot, rhizoc, and aph. Talk to your agriculturists. They are best at telling you what are the best varieties for your specific area. Talk also to your seed company reps. They can give you good advice, but I'll say talk to your, your agriculturists. So um, as always, it's a privilege and an honor to visit with you. Um, as Ashuk said, we'd rather do this in person, but this is working out as well pretty good. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about weed biology. Um, and the point I want to make here is knowing your weeds, knowing when your weeds emerge is absolutely critical to weed management. So I'm, I'm catering my message to the northern part of the valley. And I'm thinking about your, your first weeds in the spring, probably kochia and, and maybe lamb's quarter second. Um, the neat thing about kochia is although it germinates early, most of the time, the duration of kochia is not as long as it is for some of our other weeds. Although with some of our newer biotypes, that might be changing and something we keep an eye on. But I want to talk about the two on the bottom, red root pigweed and water hemp, especially water hemp. Water hemp is not going to be one of those early germinating weeds. It's, it's not going to germinate and emerge until sometime in May. But I will tell you that once water hemp starts to germinate and emerge, um, you can count on it um, germinating and emerging, um, I, I think, through the month of July and maybe even halfway through the month of August. So from that standpoint, it introduces some challenges for us that we haven't dealt with before. So the first part 
of controlling water hemp is weed identification. And I want to I want to contrast water hemp to red root pigweed. So let's start with red root pigweed. So look at these cotyledons on red root pigweed, long and narrow, okay? Sometimes I'll call these canoes because of how long and narrow they are. Now contrast that with water hemp. The cotyledons are a lot shorter and they're a lot wider than red root pigweed is. So there's other pictures here and you can see the same thing. The picture on the lower right hand corner is red root pigweed again. So early in the season, look for cotyledons as a way of differentiating. Now you can see on the first true leaves that water hemp has more of a lanceolate shaped leaf as compared to red root pigweed. Sometimes that's tricky, but these cotyledons are dead giveaways. What about later on? So I've got four different pigweeds in this picture. And I will tell you that they look very similar. The one that's different though is water hemp. So water hemp has um, a darker green color in the plant. And once again, you'll see those lanceolate shaped leaves. Now water hemp is also free of hairs. Whereas red root pigweed and Powell amaranth have some hairs on it. So, so, so what I want you to do is get familiar with water hemp. I don't care about the others. I just want you to differentiate water hemp from the others. And then the flowering structure of water hemp is also unique. So it's a much more open flowering structure. Um, flowers at a lot of different places on the, the plant um, branches or, or some of the um, other areas as compared to red root pigweed where the flowering structure is mainly on the terminal branch, the, the main branch of the plant. Now, over to Powell, sometimes we see that longer main branch. That's not always the case, but sometimes we'll see it. But generally, it's longer than what we see with red root pigweed. Maybe it's only six or eight inches as compared to this one, which might be 12 or, or 16 inches. But one characteristic of pigweeds, and I don't care which one we're talking about, is they make a lot of seed. So I would encourage you to try to eliminate pigweeds from your fields because once you have pigweeds, you have to deal with them for a number of years. And I wanna make that point with some data from, um, from Iowa State University. So this is the longevity of water hemp. And uh, once it falls into the soil, you're gonna have to manage water hemp for at least four years, maybe six years. Now, the good news is, is we have the highest germination rate the year after it goes to seed, well over 50%. Um, but the point is, is there's going to be the need to actively manage water hemp for at least four years. Now, we used to think of water hemp as something that the southern part of the valley or Mendac or southern men dealt with. Not anymore. So this is our latest survey, and we're, we're looking at, at, at maybe just over 75% of our acres. 500,000 of our acres have identified water hemp at some level, either moderate to, to severe um, levels. So um, the message here is water hemp is no longer a Southern Valley weed. It's everybody's weed challenge, and that's why we're giving it as much attention as we, we are. Now, where did those numbers come from? Well, we just recently completed a survey, and I'm only focusing on, on um, the Crookston District, the East Grand Forks District, and the Drayton District. So you can see the colors 
and, and uh, water hemp levels over time. Look at the spikes that we're seeing in 2019 and in 2020 and compare that to the average of the entire um, um, American Crystal Sugar District. So you can see that we've had a tremendous increase in the number of acres, the number of growers that identify water hemp as an important weed for them. So why, why is this? What has happened in the last 10 years or so to, to create such a, a large infestation of water hemp? And, and I answer that question by saying that water hemp was designed for modern agriculture. It was, it was built using some of the farming practices. It was built to succeed using some of the farming practices that we're using right now. So first of all, it's hard to identify. I would argue that for the first few years, we weren't identifying it properly. I've mentioned this extended germination period. I said May through the month of July, maybe even the first 15 days of August. It grows fast. Um, the seed germinates and emerges off the soil surface or in the, um, the inch, um, top one inch of soil. So conservation tillage is a good thing. I'm not going to complain about that other than to say that water hemp thrives in those conditions. So from a weed management side, there was a period of time where we were using post-emergent sprays, maybe two sprays, maybe three sprays. But the point is, is for a weed that germinates and emerges continuously, it's hard to get it when we're only spraying two or three times. I've already mentioned seed production. I've mentioned longevity. The last thing is because of male and female plants. So the flowers on, on, on different plants, we've seen a lot of diversity, both in terms of phenotypes and also the response of water hemp to herbicides. Okay, so this is a busy slide. This is our water hemp control program. So it starts with pre-emergence, then it has the early post, the, the mid post sprays. Um, we're looking at some techniques in June, including cultivating the use of the hooded sprayer. Um, once we get the plants over the canopy, some people are using the weed zapper and we're pulling weeds out, okay? So our program for managing water hemp is continuous because it has to be. That's how diverse it is, that's how important it is. I wanna talk a little bit about the lay-by herbicides for a minute. And I'm focusing on the three actives on the right. So the question on the table is, which one do you use? And my answer to that is, is they all were, if this is a conversation about water hemp control, I say they all work, okay? And I stand behind that with the data that I've generated since 2014, they all work. But the one you choose might depend on what's important to you. So if you want to, if you're concerned about replanting, you'll want to use dual because Outlook and, and Warrant have at least a three, maybe a four week replanting interval where you're not going to get stand if you replant into those residues. What about getting it activated? Choose Outlook. Outlook is the most water soluble and it's the easiest to get activated. Okay, I'm gonna skip over safety because I'm gonna talk about that since that's an important topic for farmers in the northern part of the valley. Length of control. I think water hemp, excuse me, I think warrant is the longest lasting of the three chloroacetamide herbicides. And I think that you're gonna get more lambs quarters control with warrant than the other two. Then after that, it's up to you. Um, you work well with different companies. You work well with different uh, um, um, ag retailers. 
But don't forget about the generics, especially the esmetolachlor generics. I want to talk about crop safety, sugar beet safety. And I'll tell you, whenever I, I get to the northern part of the state and I talk about water hemp and control, the question always comes up, what about safety to sugar beets? How do these chloroacetamides compare to Roundup? And I will tell you that I've conducted 86 experiments by now, 86. And there's one experiment that stands out the most out of these. And that was one that I did in 2016 down in the Wilmer area. So you can see the three chloroacetamides. You can see a single lay-by. You can see where we split the lay-by pre followed by a single lay-by pre followed by a split lay-by. So um, as you know, we like to use the pre split lay-by program. And one of the reasons we've moved away from a single lay-by is because we've seen more sugar beet damage with that particular program. So splitting our herbicide, I think, improves weed control, but it also improves crop safety, especially when you're using a, um, a pre-emergence herbicide. So these are a couple of pictures from that experiment in 2016 by Roselon. This is the glyphosate check on the left. Um, the three rows to the right in the picture on the right are the treated plot. And this is the phenotype I see. And this is a control over on the, on the top side. So what I see are sugar beets that don't have a good color and they're not actively growing. So I, I sometimes call these drunken sugar beets. They're disillusioned. They're standing still. They're not actively growing. And in this particular location, it's because we had a heavy rain event right after application that washed the herbicide into the root zone. So of course the herbicide that's the most water soluble went to the roots first and was taken up by the plants. I want to reinforce to you that this is not a rare occasion, but it can happen and it did happen before. Okay, Outlook and, and the Esmetolachlor product, so Dual Magnum, Browl, um, some of the others, Charger Basic, are all based on EC formulations. So when you spray these on a sugar beet, you're going to get this speckling phenotype. You're going to especially get it if you're using other products in combination with either Outlook or Esmetolachlor. So I have spent a lot of my time, especially in the last two years, looking at adding different products together with the chloroacetamide herbicide. So we've done this in the greenhouse. We've done this in the field. And I want to talk to you about a greenhouse experiment that we did, OK? So we started with PowerMax and Ethofumazate. That was basic. And this experiment had oil in it, and it didn't have oil. But I've averaged across oil. So let's not worry about that right now. So when we added Outlook, I saw a little more growth reduction, OK? But when we added an insecticide, a stinger to that, we saw a dramatic increase in injury. Now, the good news is, is that injury is transient. It goes away. You can see that there was less at 14 days. And when we harvested the tissue and weighed them, we didn't see any statistical difference. Um, all of these numbers are the same using statistics. But my point is, is these complex mixtures, especially products that have formulated oils, are going to increase the damage that we get with, with um, PowerMax, with Ethyl, and with our chloroacetamide herbicide. The question is, is how much water hemp is too many? And I would tell you 
that the data that um, we've seen either from Dr. Schweitzer or from Dr. Dexter on interference would indicate that even weeds that are spaced 10 feet apart are going to cause um, a weed uh, loss of yield. So they're gonna, the weeds are gonna interfere. So I wanna reinforce for a number of reasons at trying to get total water hemp control in fields. So how we're gonna do that? Well, I wanna encourage you to cultivate. So we know that cultivation removes the emerged weeds, okay, we know that. But the question we often get is, how is the cultivation going to interfere with my barrier? So this is results from Nathan Haugrud's experiments. There's three locations here. It's 14 days, it's 28 days after late germinating um, water hemp emergence. So we were looking at late germinating water hemp. The blue bars are with cultivation. The red bars are without cultivation. And you can see there's no difference here. Um, cultivation did not cause us to lose herbicide or stimulate water hemp germination and emergence from fresh soil. If anything, we saw a bump with cultivation compared to no cultivation at all. So the, the, you know, the, um, the electric systems are back. We used to call it the Lasco lightning weeder. Now we're calling it the weed zapper. And uh, the modern day version has more killing power. The boom's on the front. There's a lot better safety improvements on it. But how does it work? So we've done some experiments in, in 2019 and 2020. Um, we, we looked at eight locations in 2020. And the first thing we looked at is this wilting phenotype. And I can tell you it occurs immediately after you run the, the, the weed zapper through the field. So we see that immediately. And at least statistically, there's no difference 14 days later. Necrosis, well, necrosis increases. So that's the darkening of the stem and the leaves. And you can see that necrosis increased three, seven and 14 days after application. And necrosis is, is following overall control. So this score for necrosis is almost mimicking the overall control. And you can see across experiments, we got pretty good control. Um, but I'm gonna tell you two things. So first of all, um, remember that the water hemp has to be above the canopy before we can go out with the weed zapper. So we're getting some loss of yield from interference just by letting water hemp get that tall. And we also saw, and we didn't have as many locations, but for a highly branched plant like kochia, our control was less, mainly because the lower branches were um, very quick to fill in the gaps created by um, burning off the tops of the plants. I am an advocate for pulling weeds. I know pulling weeds is hard work, but I wanna tell you if you're gonna go through the work of pulling weeds, get them out of the field. And the reason for that is, is water hemp, is, is, it's an example of a plant where once you see the flower, you have no more than 14 days before you're seeing viable weeds or viable seeds. So pulling out uh, a water hemp plant with flowers, it just means that that seed is going to mature itself while the plant lays on the ground and you're gonna still wind up with some seeds that are, are uh, causing concerns for next year. So carry those water hemp out of the fields if you can. Okay, so I'm gonna switch to some other crops. So I'm gonna start with, um, I'm, we're gonna start with wheat. And this is uh, Dr. Howitt's slide. And what he's saying is there's a new, a new combination of Husky. This is called FX. And it stands for Phloxapir or Starane. That's part of the formulation. 
So if you're going to use this particular product, and, and I know the co-op has a policy on, on Husky herbicide, but if you're using this one, I would encourage you to use the high rates because we know singly that we need the higher rates to get good water hemp control from starring. <clears throat> There's other herbicides. Most of these herbicides are oxen group products that are mixed together. So I'm not gonna go through these other than to say that in some cases there's three or so ox and herbicides mixed together. The one that stands out is Talon, Talonar. So this has a, uh, an HPPD inhibitor herbicide, group 27 herbicide. This has a rotational restriction that doesn't allow sugar beets to follow. So lots of options in, in um, small grains, especially wheat. Now, I, I will tell you that I, I had 25 or 30 questions about controlling water, hemp, and wheat stubble last fall. So we wound up and did an experiment. We wanted to be sure. So we looked at um, PowerMax alone. We looked at um, um, a sequential PowerMax application. We looked at PowerMax plus 2,4-D. Um, we looked at PowerMax and Sharpen, and the key on this one is we mixed MSO with the, the Sharpen because that's the way Sharpen likes it. And then we did a three-way um, PowerMax, Sharpen, and Valor. So um, I will tell you right now that I have concerns about Valor and potential carryovers. So I would only prefer to talk about the top four. And I will tell you that seven days after application, this sharpened treatment looked unbelievable, okay? There was, there was hardly any um, signs of water hemp left. But if you wait till three weeks, it was hard to see the difference between sharpened and 2,4-D. So I would suggest that both of those in combination with Roundup are good ways of controlling um, water hemp and stubble. Okay, so this is a busy slide. This is one where you might want to get your camera out. So what this is, what this slide is, is the best programs that we know in soybeans and corn for controlling water hemp, okay? So some of these herbicides might have rotational restrictions again. So you've got to take a look at that. But if you want a list of good water hemp programs, here's the list. Okay, so the rest of my slides are going to be one slide topics. So um, bear with me on, on the transitions from slide to slides. Common ragweed control, okay? Um, we, we talked before about two ounces, maybe three ounces. We talked about two followed by two. What we would like to do is increase that from two to three ounces. Or if you were at three, we'd like to go from three to four ounces. And the reason is, is because we did not see consistent control in 2020. So um, you'll see this in the recommendations that the, the co-op has posted. You won't see two ounces anymore. We wanna increase two to three and three to four. Shop meetings. We have scheduled shop meetings for Drayton, East Grand Forks, and Crookston districts. So the dates are on the screen. We're working on the locations. The key here, we wanna make sure that we're in a shop that's heated, especially with this weather. The key here is these are gonna be small group meetings. Um, we're gonna to try to limit participation but I believe, especially to do some training on water hemp, we've got to get together and look at some plants. So these have been scheduled through the agriculturalists. Controlling kochia in soybeans, okay? So remember a few years ago, I used to talk about controlling water hemp in soybeans with Liberty. Use the Liberty Link soybean system if you have kochia in soybean, I'd like you to go two different ways. 
to mix Liberty with Roundup and use the appropriate soybean or to mix Liberty with Enlist. So using the uh, appropriate soybean. Now, while Dr. Jenks' data indicates good kochia control with Liberty alone, I'm a doubting Thomas on this one. I, I, I think his conditions, we don't usually see Liberty working this good this early in the season at 65 degrees. So for kochia control, I want to see you mix Liberty with either Roundup or 24D. I've talked before about wild oat resistant weeds. And this is a continuation of that message. Um, these are site of action one and two herbicides. It's not uncommon, especially in Pembina County, to see wild oat resistant weeds. So that's something that should be important um, as you're making decisions in small grains. A quick Palmer amaranth update. So we're starting to see some challenges with Palmer amaranth in North Dakota. We especially had some concerns in 2020. So these green counties are places where um, we had some introduction in fields because we were using sunflower screenings that were used as livestock feed and then the manure spread on field. So um, that's a practice that has been eliminated, but you can see we have some counties where we're gonna have to be vigilant to track Palmer amaranth. On the Minnesota side, you know, by and large, Minnesota has, um, has eliminated Palmer amaranth, especially from these original counties. Um, They've gone back and there is no evidence of Palmer amaranth left. So the counties that are where they're still actively monitoring are Lincoln County in the west and Winona and Houston counties in the east. But by and large, Minnesota is fighting to eradicate Palmer amaranth. And we're going to do the same in North Dakota. We're just not as far along. A new biotech trait. So the trait is called HT2 sugar beets, and it, com and it combines glyphosate, dicamba, and glufosinate. So we're starting the field evaluation of various programs in 2021. This is a, a KWS project that KD KWS will call Truvera. So that'll be the, the commercial name for the HTT2 concept. And once regulatory approval occurs, and we're hoping that occurs sometime in 2025, um, then um, the other companies will be able to license the trait and, and sell it from KWS. So this trait is still a ways off. We have to be extremely vigilant so we can get to those years. Um, but there is a biotech solution in the pipeline. So with that, I, I um, like the others, I, I get my funding from um, the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board, which means my funding comes from you. And I'm extremely grateful for your generosity. Likewise, there are growers in the northern end of the valley that have collaborated with me. Um, James Bergman is on the phone today. Thank you so much for, for working with me. Um, sometimes doing weed control work is, is difficult. Thanks for working with me on that. And of course, with the experiment stations in both Minnesota and North Dakota. So my contact information, um, these numbers are the same numbers that my predecessors have used. Please call me please email me, follow me on Twitter if you want to see some of what I see in the field. And then with that, here's the code. So um, the uh, QR code for getting credit for the meeting, I'll get the cursor out of the way so you can take a picture of that and get credit for listening to my presentation. Very good. Well, uh, as the others have mentioned, thanks for joining us in this uh, somewhat unusual uh, format. I guess it's become unusual for a lot of us to uh, work through Zoom and other platforms like it. So uh, great to have you and uh, 
I'll get going. Uh, this first slide, uh, uh, you mentioned in your uh, survey responses that springtails were an issue for some of you. So I did want to uh, uh, include springtail management. Um, and uh, this data is actually, we got a, a fairly good infestation at a uh, site in Eastern Montana near the uh, North Dakota, Montana border. And uh, it's the second year we've gone out there. The growers out there are experiencing pretty significant uh, springtail infestations. And uh, they, uh, there are some growers out there that uh, have reported uh, what they would classify as failures of some of the uh, the neonicotinoid seed treatments to manage springtails effectively. So uh, we're uh, not only trying to help them because they are, some of them are North Dakota citizens as well and uh, part of our uh, sugar beet group. So uh, we wanna help them, but I'm also concerned about maybe down the road us having issues like that. So we really wanna optimize as my title of my talk indicated, optimize the uh, efficacy of some of our control programs for, for this uh, group of insects. Uh, the springtails are a complex, there are many species, and thus far what we've seen is they have a different species out there in the Mondac growing area. So uh, what we had a lot of variability at this site, not only in the springtail infestation, but uh, uh, within some of the plots as well, as far as agronomic things. So uh, as you can see here, this is, I'm just focusing on yield and then revenue. The revenue gain is that above the untreated check. So uh, we just subtracted the revenue, uh, um, gained gross revenue from the untreated check. And that's what you've got. It's not a true net gain because it uh, doesn't incorporate the cost of the product. Uh, that's kind of a moving target every year and there are bonuses. It's too hard to really keep up with that stuff. But this gives you some idea of the relative returns you'd get from some of these treatments. As you can see in the yield column, they're all followed by an A. They're sharing a letter, so they're not statistically different from each other. So I can't really say a whole lot about them other than uh, we see some trends that uh, counter at a uh, higher rate did perform better. Uh, MIDAC and newly registered products that a few of you indicated you're using um, performed pretty well and better at a as a T-band than it did uh, dribble and furl. So that's a little bit of a, a negative result because uh, not too many growers want to have uh, nozzles on or a nozzle on each row of their planter. Uh, other things we've seen over the years, this this follows product or uh, performance uh, patterns we've seen before, but with Mustang, we tended to see uh, better better performance when we T-banded it than when we put it put it uh, dribble and furrow. We had more treatments in this trial than, than are indicated here. I actually had to cut some out, but Mustang as a dribble and furrow was, was uh, down below, below MIDAC dribble and furrow. Um, so those are kind of the trends, but what we were trying to do is see if we could maybe combine at plant uh, insecticides with seed treatments and it suggests um, that uh, the findings here suggest that that may be a, a good way, good tool for if you're having uh, trouble managing springtails and sugar beet. So to kind of summarize that part, and then we'll move on to root maggots. Uh, the, the seed treatments in our area should provide pretty good control. Uh, but if you do experience uh, what you would classify as a failure or uh, unsatisfactory control, then you might want to combine it with another uh, type of tool uh, at planting. Uh, next, I'll move on to uh, sugar beet root maggot. And uh, really concerned about the trend, the population trends that we've been experiencing for the last few years. This is a 14-year uh, data set and the our fly counts these are fly counts on a valley wide basis an average per trap across the entire valley and this number here for 2020 is uh the second in the last second highest in the last 14 years so the trend is not going the direction that 
you nor I would want to see it go. Uh, next, this one is a valley-wide uh, um, illustration as well, but this looks at activity over time within the growing season. And like we've seen the last few years, um, we had uh, well, we had a main peak, but we also had a pretty significant increase in activity early on in uh, in early June. About two weeks later was the main peak. So that's another concern. You know, what are we going to be doing with these early emerging flies? Uh, what we've seen thus far is it's uh, majority males. Um, we still have a lot of data on that to really uh, uh, put that in stone, but that's what the pattern suggests. So uh, there wouldn't be a lot of mating going on then, but uh, those, uh, those males will be maturing then over a few days and will be mating then with females over the next few you know, a week or so. So um, anyway, uh, the numbers are very high and we've got bimodal peaks uh, happening more often and early emergence happening more often as well. Uh, that has translated also to slight increases in, in uh, root maggot feeding injury in grower fields. This data is collected from fields that reached the fly count, the cumulative fly count threshold of 43 flies per trap. Again, that's cumulative. And then we go back in and we damage rate all those fields. And that trend is upward as well. Uh, a two on a zero to nine is then not that big, but within this average, there were a, a, a higher frequency of fields that were in the five range. So growers were losing money in those, in those situations. Uh, next, I'll uh, move on, transition to the uh, what we're looking at for a forecast this year. This is published in the Crop and Pest Report. Typically, uh, American Crystal puts it on their website. Uh, we also have it in the pocket guide, and it will be in the research extension reports as well. Uh, so this says 2017, as I've mentioned before, this is not a typo. Um, this I'll, I'll transition this, I'll animate it so it goes through uh, 2020 what it looked like here and then through to 2020, and then uh, what we expect for 2021. There was the change to 2020, that's from 17, so a couple of years gap there, um, but uh, quite an expansion in its range, quite a bit, especially over into Minnesota. And then what we're expecting in 2021 is a lot more moderate infestation, those areas are filling in and uh, we're not necessarily having more of the severe or the high uh, risk areas, but we're really seeing an overall expansion of its territory uh, in between some of those areas that were uh, orange last year or were uh, filled in some of those that were yellow last year. So um, a lot more moderate risk in the map this time. Each year I pr produce a list of locations that we expect the highest risk. And typically on this map, a few years back, I was able to squeeze the high risk field locations and the moderate risk locations in the same slide. Uh, because of the expansion of the uh, root maggot uh, infestations, uh, there's not room for that on this slide. So this is what our uh, moderate risk areas look like. And that's a fairly long, uh, longer list uh, for each state than uh, typical as well. Uh, next, we'll move into some uh, research uh, findings uh, over the past several years. Uh, mul multiple year trials will be presented. Uh, some of those are two to three year trials. Uh, there's maybe one that's a single year. I guess it's a couple of them. And then there are a few that are between five and six year data sets. So they're pretty robust data sets that I think you can hang your hat on. Uh, this first one involves uh, at plant protection plus a single uh, granular application at post emergence or a single at plant granule along with a seed treatment. And uh, again, I've got the uh, significance letters uh, here indicating uh, 
differences between treatments. Anytime any one of these treatments within a column uh, share a letter, they are not statistically different from each other. And just to make this easier to read, I put the uh, blue rectangle in there. And uh, essentially, uh, these top four treatments were not statistically different from each other with regard to either recoverable sucrose or root tonnage and provided some pretty good returns on investment as well. Uh, one thing that's been interesting over the years, uh, again, this is a six year data set. Um, the uh, at plant application of, of counter and you could use Lohr's band 15G as well at, at, at its max, max rate. But uh, combining that with a insecticide treated seed um, tends to perform very well. So it's fairly simple where you just put, put stuff on at planting and you do well. Um, but it, uh, we have also discovered over the years that counter works fairly well as a post-emergence material. Uh, this next one involves uh, post sprays, which is more commonly used as your survey responses indicated. Uh, we're, we've got varying at plant applications of uh, counter, and then we've got poncho beta also as an at plant, and then either alone or with a either a one or a two pint application of Lohr's band. And we've used both Lohr's band 4E and advanced. We've done some testing and they don't really perform uh, differently with regard to root maggot. So I took the liberty of combining that data. And by the way, all of these combined data sets that I'm showing you, I do rigorous statistical testing to make sure that I can combine this data before I, I do uh, share it with you. So these have been tested um, for that, that integrity. And again, these top treatments, uh, I put the uh, rectangle around, they're all sharing an A. So they're not statistically different from each other. So either a C treatment and then maximizing a C treatment or a moderate rate of counter and maximizing your post spray is a fairly good approach. Um, and then, uh, or making it a little more, uh, you know, you optimize or you actually add a little revenue by going more aggressive at planting with your at plant granule Uh, this is what some of the plots looked like uh, over the years. Uh, our untreated check was beaten up pretty bad. By the way, this this uh, we uh, randomly collect root, uh, roots from these plots, and we stop at a prescribed location within each plot, same location with each plot, within each plot there. And uh, uh, this happened to be one random location where there was no beat. So that's how bad the pressure was. Um, up in the uh, top upper left, we've got counter alone at a high rate. Beets don't look too bad, but they're a little bit scarred uh, near the tip. Uh, when we add the Lohr's band, we get a little better protection, but those are a little bit beat, uh, beaten up too. The pressure has been pretty substantial. Uh, similarly, the poncho beta at, um, with a, as a seed treatment and then combining with Lohr's band um, looked pretty good also. A few years ago, we started looking at uh, dual and then comparing those with uh, single or even triple applications. Uh, triple meaning at plant of some form combined with an at plant granule, possibly if it's a seed treatment, and then coming back with a post, either a single post application or a dual application of, of uh, post components. And uh, this treatment on top here turned out to be very good. Uh, we're beginning to start looking at Lohr's band advanced or Lohr's band. We're actually shifting now and, and looking at 4E as well, but uh, maximizing this part of it and going with uh, two pints. And that also looks pretty good, but we're, we're able to actually do very well with, with this, as you can see with the revenue and the yield. Uh, and you can see the trend here as well, generally dual and triple application uh, regimes, if you will, tend to do very well and optimize not only yield, but also uh, the gross revenue above the untreated check. 
even the single treatments were easily paying for themselves. And this happened to be a five-year data set. Uh, this is what the plots look like. And I think this illustrates pretty well that you, uh, you can't necessarily assume that uh, plot, uh, your field that may look okay above ground may be more stressed than you think. This happened to be a fairly wet growing season that the, these photos were taken. And uh, um, there was a pretty significant uh, differences between treatments uh, in this, this trial. Uh, last year was the first year of MIDAC being used in sugar beet, registered for use in sugar beet. And a few of you indicated using it. Uh, and I've been getting questions about, well, how does it look compared to counter? And uh, counter comes up a lot because the majority of uh, granular use is involves counter. And what we found, this happens to be a three-year analysis, and it performs similarly, no statistical differences between uh, uh, MIDAC when applied dribble and furrow and counter at its moderate rate. That's just 84% of the full labeled rate. So it's not a comparison uh, necessarily between counter at its best um, in, you know, type of scenario. So um, it looks okay. It's, it's not a Cadillac, I would say, but it may fit very well into growers uh, production systems. Uh, this is what some of the plots looked like. Um, this was actually taken two years ago. You can see that uh, there's similar canopies between the two. Actually, in this one, uh, the MIDAC looks a little stressed. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, next, I wanted to show you, uh, this is some work we've been doing the last few years, but I'll just show you this uh, 2020 finding because it involved or uh, some new look a new look at asana and uh, what we wanted to look at these are all single applications uh, they're not really foliar only but we're we're uh, many so any of the peak flies are foliar and then where we have t3 tb that's a three inch t band so uh, what we found is that these four were the top treatments with regard to root injury or root protection, I guess I would say, uh, recoverable sucrose and tons per acre generated excellent results. It's quite amazing that we got this kind of a result out of a single application of counter at its high rate. Uh, this is a first year, the 2020 was the first year we were looking at, uh, at uh, Yuma. This is essentially Lors Band 4E there's no at plant protection in these peak fly treatments. And then there's no post-emergence treatment, by the way, for the, uh, the uh, treatments that have a banded application. And uh, so that was one finding that was surprising. Well, uh, Yuma at two pints looked very good. When we applied it at one pint, it didn't look quite so good. I mean, we were probably getting some help out of it, if you will but it was not statistically different from the untreated check uh, on any of the parameters that we measured. Uh, another thing, and I, the reason I've got this highlighted in blue, Asana, we used, uh, we applied it at its maximum rate. This was at plant as, as a three inch T band, and we combined it in a tank mix with exponent, which is a synergist. Uh, for pyrethroid insecticides, and it definitely made a difference. This is just one year of data, but it looked uh, looked very good. It, it brought Asana up to where it was not statistically outperformed by uh, the very top treatment as a single application. So um, I, I think that uh, suggests that we've maybe got another option in the toolbox, which is really good news. Uh, this next one has a, a lot of treatments. I actually deleted two out of here, so uh, it, it could have been even busier. What we were wanting to look at here, though, was uh, applying at plant insecticides with uh, 1030 at the same time as 1034O, and then uh, 
and then some combinations as well. So on the far left, we've got counter at its moderate rate, either with or without 1034L fertilizer. The fertilizer was dribbled in furrow. And then we've got the same thing at a high rate, the high label, maximum labeled rate. Uh, then we've got MIDAC in the green bars here, kind of in the center, dribble and furrow or a T-band. And then we've got the MIDAC with T-band or T-banded uh, tank mixed with 1034O. And then a post application of Bifender. And uh, uh, Bifender is not labeled for sugar beet yet, but it's something that uh, Vive Crop Protection is pursuing. So we did want to include it in the, the presentation today. Uh, the next series of bars, we have Poncho Beta, either uh, with just 1034O. Um, we've got then Poncho Beta and MIDAC in these bars with the hash marks on them. And then the far right one of that cluster includes asteroid at plant in that tank mix with 1034O and MIDAC. And there are no differences here as this indicates, suggesting that we didn't really have any negative, significant negative impacts on stand counts. When we took this to yield, the, the, I would say the results were, were generally even better. Um, with counter, it looked like possibly dribbling in furrow, the 1034O at the same time as apply, not with, but at the same time going across the field with the uh, uh, dribble, dribble in furrow 1034O fertilizer. Uh, it was not statistically different, but there was a slight, uh, I don't even want to call it a reduction, but at least numerically there was slightly uh, lower yield, but not statistical. So we're getting good protection and uh, good yield as well. With MIDAC, we found that the dribble and furrow tended to do better. It's not always statistically different, but that's pretty a pretty sizable difference in yield. Uh, moving over to Poncho Beta, when we uh, uh, added the MIDAC, we started bumping up the yield. Those were not statistically different from each other. But uh, the good news on this is that we don't have a negative impact on yield by combining MIDAC with 1034O and Asteroid on Poncho Beta treated seed. Uh, I will uh, wrap the uh, root maggot stuff up with a point I want to make. This uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, differences in canopy or uh, lack thereof symptomology for. Uh, regarding root maggot feeding injury. This is what our plots looked like in a moderate infestation at Thompson, North Dakota, a couple of years ago. I think Tim Myron is in the audience and uh, uh, we have him to thank for uh, letting us do our work on that, that land. Uh, this is what the roots ended up looking like. Uh, the counter alone was significantly impacted as was the poncho beta alone. They don't necessarily look all that beaten up. Uh, it was a, uh, a little dry on top, and uh, so a lot of the feeding was near the, the tips. Uh, this, the untreated check got meat beaten up actually quite badly. And this is what the data looked like. So even under moderate pressure, we were uh, getting these kind of increases in revenue and statistical, statistically significant increases in revenue or, or yield uh, both uh, recoverable sucrose per acre and tons per acre by uh, we could go on with moderate uh, moderate rate of counter or a uh, seed treatment and then come back with a more aggressive or maybe a not so aggressive but a post-emergence spray rescue spray uh, made quite a difference in in all the parameters that we studied or, or uh, measured in this trial so it really drives it home. This included not only Thompson, but this included a couple of years at St. Thomas where we had more, more moderate infestations over the years. So with regard to root maggots, um, I'm really concerned about the population trends and the number of locations that are at high risk. Um, as you saw in the data, during the uh, past few years, we've had early fly emergence and double peaks. 
So that complicates how we manage this pest. Uh, one thing that can help with that is a early uh, sort of a jump start uh, with a strong at plant control program. And uh, maybe this is just more of a rhetorical thing, but are we possibly not being aggressive enough? Why are these populations and increasing like they are? Um, is it possible that we're not taking the modern infestations uh, seriously enough? Um, with that, uh, the keys to, to uh, good control with, uh, of the root maggot, I would say know your acres very well. That's within season as well as, as historically. Um, if you're at, if you've got areas that are at moderate to high risk, risk, uh, try to be aggressive with your root maggot control. Uh, there's uh, at plant uh, protection is is really a, a very good way to start the growing season. Uh, another thing I would say avoid sole reliance reliance on on some of the lesser performing products. Uh, we've got a lot of data indicating what the better products are for at plant and post emergence as well. So uh, just uh, try to be aggressive with uh, ma managing those populations. Another key to success would be monitoring what's happening in the field as well as uh, in your uh, neighbor's fields. Uh, you can do that by monitoring the fly counts that are posted online three times a week during the growing season. And it's always good to keep an eye on what's going on in your own fields. Uh, also, we uh, have the uh, NDSU root maggot model that's uh, really helpful in predicting when outbreaks are going to occur and it's uh, published in various venues online and in print as well. So as far as controlling the root maggot, we know the seed treatments and MIDAC perform similarly to 7.5 pounds of counter. Uh, the MIDAC, we believe it works best as a dribble and furrow application. We've seen that MIDAC is safe when combined with, with a seed treatment and 10340 starter fertilizer. Uh, it's kind of a new kid on the block for at plant applications. Asana appears to perform well, but you've got to use that, uh, that uh, synergist exponent with it to optimize control. Uh, post emergence control, there's really uh, no substitute to that with moderate to high infestations. You really almost have to expect you're going to have to put something on. Uh, and we've seen major benefits from those applications. Uh, liquids, we want them applied between two and five days ahead of peak fly. If you're expecting to apply two applications, I'd, I'd err toward the five or six days even ahead of peak fly, especially with early emergences like we've seen. Uh, granules can be much more flexible uh, post-emergence, anywhere from five to 13 days ahead of peak fly. Uh, if you're not set up for post granules, and a lot of you are not, uh, consider applying an at plant insecticide of some form uh, along with your insecticide treated seed. Uh, I threw this in there if I have time for, uh, for a, uh, just a couple more slides. Um, uh, early season injury, uh, I, or I, you mentioned in your surveys that grasshoppers were a concern. Uh, or you had to treat for grasshoppers this past year. Uh, that could be an issue this year. We've got a dry winter thus far, and they do very well in dry, they get going very well in dry springs. Uh, we don't currently have an economic threshold for managing them, managing them in sugar beet, but I've uh, put together some guidelines based on economic thresholds from other row crops. So generally, uh, within the field, you're needing to get up in that five range on a per yard basis uh, before you should think about controlling them and you can tolerate a whole lot more in the field margins if you've got grassy field margins uh, keep an eye on the field and you can even do border treatments to manage them also uh, grasshopper and uh, some mentioned cutworms as well I would say these all of these products work fairly well on cutworm control also, but this is for grasshoppers. Uh, these, these, all these products should do a pretty good job. Uh, the larger the grasshopper, the more product you should probably use. 
So I would that would be, apply to Asana as well as, as chlorpyrifos, which is Lorsban and all the generics. And then I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, back off of the rate, the full rate of Mustang Max either. Um, I've got this highlighted here because we have to be careful if it's a later season uh, infestation of grasshoppers, which you may not need to treat. They can take some defoliation, but if you choose to treat later on in the season, uh, you have to be careful of this pre-harvest interval of 50 days. With that, I'll uh, wrap it up. And I want to especially thank the Research and Education Board uh, for funding our, our research, for the confidence you uh, place in us to uh, research these issues for you. I want to thank my technician, Jake Rickus, for helping uh, make the program succeed. Uh, I want to thank uh, the American Crystal Ag staff who helped us vastly increase our, our, the breadth of our fly monitoring program. We used to do about 30 fields. This past year, we did over 120, uh, thanks to their help. I want to thank the seed and chemical industry as well for providing materials for us to test and to use in our trials. And I also want to thank my colleagues at the universities for assisting with harvest and, and other interactions as well. I also should thank uh, several growers. There are multi-year data sets there, so I had a long list of growers that I should sell, help or uh, thank also for helping us with uh, land to do our research on their farms. So with that, I will wrap it up. If there are any questions in the comment box or if anyone would like to unmute and ask, and while we're waiting, the QR code, we're again, uh, we're repeating, is uh, on the top of the slide there if you do want to scan it and uh, get credit, CEU credits. There was one question in the chat box, Mark. <clears throat> um, someone would like to know if you have tried Contour 23, Contour 20G band and MIDAC DIF together to control root maggot or will you recommend using the two together or will there be a phytotoxicity problem? Uh, that's an excellent question. And usually when someone says it's an excellent question, that means they don't know the answer. Uh, we have not tested that combination yet. Uh, it's certainly open to uh, pursuing that. Uh, you know, with MIDAC being a moderate uh, performing as a standalone at plant, uh, it's something we probably should look into and we're wanting to do some more uh, plant safety trials this coming year. So if we have room, that's something I, I probably should look at, but yet, and we have not tested that yet. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, there was one more with moderate root, root maggot pressure. Uh, should you use two pints of Lars Ban ahead of the second peak of the force or the second peak? Um, I would say under moderate pressure, um, if you're pretty much anticipating or planning on making more than one application, uh, split applications work really well. And we've seen that uh, they actually, if you're going to apply a total of two pints, uh, which you maybe don't plan it that way, but uh, we've seen that one pint applied twice is more effective than uh, two plant pints applied in a single application. And I think that's very applicable now with the early emergence that we're seeing. So, uh, but in, in yeah, I'm, I'm uh, it, it kind of depends on, to really answer your question, kind of depends on what your at plant uh, procedure was. If you're using a moder moderate uh, performing product like a seed treatment, um, or uh, say a Mustang at planting, then I'd, I'd, I would suggest being more aggressive post-emergence and going with that two pints. And you could even apply that a second time if you needed. Joe Hastings, any word for your producers, Allied Industry? Yeah, uh, thanks again, uh, all the researchers for uh, another round of great presentations and education, so thank you. Yep, you're hitting our top concerns that uh, our growers are, are worried about. It's a cost after last year. Water hemp the battles there. And 
bit maggot and our root diseases. So uh, we'll be having our Your Way to Grow meetings as well. Being a lot of those same topics uh, with our egg staff and you guys and any questions that you have during those or you think of some afterwards, uh, we're happy to work with you too and answer those questions and uh, with the production practices that can improve uh, those situations. So thanks. All right, I think um, it's good for us to meet in person, but on a cold day like today, it's it's good to kind of be in your office or in your home where it's warm and get all the information that you will get at the grower seminar. So thank you for signing up. Uh, thank you for participating. And we will be getting more information in a similar manner to you during the growing season. Uh, we will be working through Joe Hastings and your leaders, and we'll be getting more information for you during the growing season. With that, thank you all. Have a wonderful day.